Don't You Travel. And our women who made a difference. A cool kids gift to our community. Welcome to a personal interview of Jean Mark conducted by Jay on April 17th, 2007. Okay, my first question is, what did you think about school as you were growing up? What did I think about school as I was growing up? Well, I went to a one-room country school, and when I was in the sixth grade, I was the only student in my class. And I had a very perceptive teacher, and she just let me go at my own speed. So that year I read about 120 library books and finished my math book ahead of time, and she gave me uh, enrichment things. So I'm sure people think if you go to a one-room school, you have a deprived education maybe, but my education was great. Okay, that's good. Um, Were you in any religious, political, or social groups as a child? As a child, I belonged to 4-H and uh, had a Guernsey calf and did other things. And I was in different church groups like the Luther League and, and the Young People's Group. And that, that was pretty much it. And if out on a farm, there aren't as many opportunities as in town. There's not a Y swim team or anything like that you can participate in. So that was basically it. Um, so... What college did you go to? Exactly? <coughs> I started at the University of Wisconsin La Crosse, and then I, I changed my major. I decided I wanted to major in medical technology, and that wasn't offered there at the time. So then I transferred to Madison and graduated from there. All right. So when you went to UW Madison, did you get like a scholarship or something, or did so? Uh, or did, how did you get some money to go there? Because it's a really expensive college. Well, it probably relatively wasn't as expensive then as it is now. But I worked, and my parents helped. And I took out some student loans that I paid after I was working. So that's basically how I paid for it. I, had, I worked at the Red Jot Potato Chip Factory <laughs> 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 and had all kinds of interesting jobs while I went to school. So. And what would you say would be the most interesting job that you had throughout the school? You mean while I was a student? Mm-hmm. Well, wh- uh, w- one of the ladies that I worked for, her husband had been one of the uh, deans at the university, and she was older, and so her her kids didn't want her to be alone anymore because she'd, she'd t- taken a tumble. So I used to go there in the afternoons, and I would read to her, and then I would fix her afternoon tea, and then before I go home, she'd send me to the Tile House, which is kind of like a cheap hamburger place to, to get hamburgers for her. I think, I think maybe the kids didn't want her to have those. I don't know. But she was a very interesting lady. Mrs. Schlichter was her name. In fact, there's even a dormitory in Madison named for her husband. So how far did you plan on taking your education to? Well, I guess I planned on getting my um, bachelor's and working, and I guess I really didn't think beyond that because I, I got a job at Gunderson Luther as soon as I graduated and uh, worked and then met my husband and got married and had three kids, ping, 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 and uh, th- that kind of determines your life, I guess. What kind of job did you had, uh, have at Gunderson Luther? I worked in the laboratory as a medical technologist. And we would, you know, analyze all kinds of specimens. We'd go out on the floor and collect blood specimens and cross-match blood and all that sort of stuff. Um, with the bachelor's in medical technology, what kind of job were you looking for exactly? Well, th- that's what I was looking for, a laboratory that's job. That's the exact one you're looking for? Yeah. Right. Well. Um, uh, do you think that if you didn't grow up on a farm doing hard work, you would not have done all of this volunteer work and jobs that you had? I, th- I think more than growing up on a farm, I think it was the influence of my parents because my parents were always involved in community activities, and I guess I just, I just assumed that was natural. It wasn't a, a big deal as far as I was concerned. It was just what you do. All right. Um. So how did you start doing the volunteer work that (coughs) you have done in your later life? Well, I guess I just saw there was a need and I, you know, I was a Girl Scout leader for a number of years and uh, 
I was on lots of different boards. And when, once you start volunteering, you know, they, if you're on one board, they think, well, gee, maybe when there's an opening on the board and we're nominating committee is looking for somebody, why your name kind of gets in the pool, I think. And so one volunteer job led to another volunteer job. Um, how did your childhood affect the way you looked at volunteer work? I think because my parent parents were community volunteers, I I guess I didn't think it was that big a deal. I, I just thought it was, I don't know if you've ever heard the expression, uh, service is the rent we pay for living here on earth. And I, th I think that was my parents' philosophy, and that's my philosophy too. You give back. All right. And... What women's issues do you feel are important for like the League of Women Voters? Well, I, w I was thinking last night about some of the big things. Like way back in the 60s, I was president of the League of Women Voters from 67 to 69. And back at that time, fair housing, you're too young to know all this, but there were race riots in Milwaukee at, at that, prior to that. And uh, fair housing became a big issue, and the league was very in the forefront of that. And they promoted it, and it did pass the city council th that a fair housing ordinance was implemented in La Crosse. And that was a big issue at that time that I was proud to have been a part of. And um, I guess the other big thing for the league was when we did the book. Have, have you seen the book that the women... Is it called The Storybook Project, or...? No, no, it's it's a it's a book that that the league put together for the seventy fifth here, this one. It's about the history of and uh, Rachel Gunderson and I were the f primary fundraisers for this project, and Margaret Larson was the editor of the book, and we published this book because we felt. If you if you look at women, if you look at the history of lacrosse, very rarely are women mentioned. It's like they didn't exist, and we felt it was important to tell the story of what women had contributed to the lacrosse community, and we didn't want to do it from the perspective of women who made the society pages and that sort of stuff. We wanted it to be the ordinary women who did uh, uh, remarkable things, and uh, so that's why we called it for the common good because it was just ordinary women like our mothers who would probably have never made a, a regular history book, but they were the people who were the caregivers, they were the people who worked in the church, and we wanted to recognize those women. So I think th this is a very important accomplishment of the League of Women Voters, and I think today, this project, I mean, introducing us to new technology and and uh, telling the story of women via the internet and podcasts and all that sort of stuff, I think is an important contribution. And we're thankful that you young students are willing to participate. Okay. Um, with the storybook project, mm -hmm. um, were there a lot of other women help you that were there to help you coordinate it? No, that, that was basically my own idea. I'd read about it in a church magazine, about in, primarily in Illinois, and how they would go in. Theirs was more of a prison type thing as opposed to a jail project. But they would go in, and they would bring age-appropriate books, and the women could pick out the books, read the book to their child, and record it on cassette tape. And then they would send the book and the t tape to the child. So there would be some communication between the mother and child while the mother was incarcerated. And uh, so I was on the jail ministry board at the time and I approached the chaplain and, and uh, the jail administrator and they agreed. And so I, I, there have only been a few people involved. I, at first I did it by myself, but then as a security issue, they felt that there should be two women there. And so Kay Boyd was my faithful partner all these years and we'd go in once a month and and uh, do the project and about a year ago yeah a little over a year ago 
we were starting to be concerned because fewer and fewer people were having cassette recorders. Everybody was going to CD or DVD. And so uh, the ra radio station was nice enough to give us a digital tape recorder. So now we are, we give them the option of a cassette and CD, but I'd say 95% of the time people want CDs. And so I've had to learn a new technology, how to download this information and burn it on a CD. <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't go as fast as I'd like it to. And for my, I'd also like to learn how to, um, you know, like maybe scan the picture of the book and burn it on the CD. But that's for another day, I guess. All right. And, uh, and for the book that you wrote, like the main one about baseball, mm -hmm. what gave you the urge to write it? Well, I think after we finished the the League of Women Voters book for the common good, it, I sort of thought, hey, maybe I could do this about th my brother's baseball team. And so I had participated in some of the oral interviews for the book, and so I practiced on my brother do <laughs> doing some oral interviews. And it was a really, I thought, a neat story. And so it took me about nine years, not that I was working on it all that time. I'd put it away and pick it up and put it away and pick it up. But finally, last J July, it was published. And um, it's a good feeling when it's done. A and the people, the baseball players and stuff have been very appreciative, too, of, of getting the story told. That's, have you, the rest of you seen? The, the title is When is the Team Coming, and, and the, how I got the title is these were a bunch of farm boys who started playing baseball. They were in grade school when they started, and they didn't have uniforms. They had bib overalls and work shoes, and, and so they didn't have uniforms, and they'd go to play these older uh, teams, and they'd come, and, and the fans and the, and the players would say, well, when is the team coming? because they expected somebody in uniforms, and so that's how I got the title of the book. Okay, um, <laughs> how was the long and enjoyable experience of the work that you have done over your life? What were the ups and downs? The ups and downs. Well, I have a tendency not to dwell on the downs too much. I think I'm an optimist by nature. And um, I guess I really remember the ups more than the downs. Mm -hmm. I, guess, I guess one of the downs is uh, you see people who are in um, who have a lot of conflict, a lot of problems in their life, and you'd like to go and help them, but you realize that they themselves are going to have to, I mean, you can support them somewhat, but that they themselves are really going to have to work through and solve this situation. And what exactly were the ups? Like, what were the good points in the work that you did? Like, your favorite ones? Okay, well, talking about the storybook project, uh, one of the, one night we had a gal, and she wanted she was very intent on recording her story and then afterwards she said well I'm giving my son up for adoption and so I want him to know what his mother's voice sounded like and so you feel well you really made a connection here you you did something that was important and um, what are some of the other ups I say when I was on the Lutheran Hospital Board, one of the one of the positive things that happened is we, we established a daycare center for the people who work there, and that was an important endeavor. Um, well th I can tell you something that isn't exactly volunteer work. I'm I'm really into genealogy. My grandmother came from Norway as a young woman. And so I've been trying to piece together all the parts of her story. And I just discovered that uh, the boat that she came on through Ellis Island, and that was really neat. She came in 1901 as a young woman on the SS Majestic. 
And when I did my husband's genealogy, his mother and her siblings and her mother came from the Ukraine in 1907 on the very same boat. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? It's, it's really fun. And I would encourage you, if you want to give your relatives and your parents and your grandparents the best gift that you can give them is to take the skills that you have learned in this project and tell your family story. It's much more important than my story, but they'll thank you a thousand times because I wish I would have talked more to my grandmother when she was still alive and even to my parents. But not, you know, now it's too late. I have to try and find these things out for myself because I didn't think to ask them. All right, and uh, were you in like a club or something called the Sons of Norway? Yep. <laughs> Sons of Norway. And uh, was it actually a club or was it like an organization or something? Well, it's an organization. At one time there were the Sons of Norway and the Daughters of Norway. And the daughters, there still is Daughters of Norway out on the West Coast, like primarily in Seattle, Oregon, California. But there was kind of a merger in the, I think it was 1950 for most of the, the United States. And it, it, it's an organization that meets monthly, has a cultural program that tells something about the history and the culture of Norway. And of course they have a good lunch and uh, they have about 500 members. They meet at, uh, they had to get a new meeting place because uh, the membership increased so much. So they meet at the American Legion every month and do different Norwegian cultural activities. Like what kind of activities would you be doing? Okay, they, they have, okay, they have um, a traditional Norwegian dinner in um, December and they do the traditional Norwegian things like dancing around the Christmas tree and, and those sort of things. And in May, Sutendamai is Norwegian Independence Day, and so they usually have a dinner. And they participate in parades like the Westby Sutendamai Parade and the Holman Parade. And um, then during the year, they have um, different cultural uh, things done at the meeting as part of the program. And you were Miss Oktoberfest once? He, Mrs. Oktoberfest in 2000, the um, millennium year, I guess, huh? And um, that was a great experience. It was a complete surprise to me. And I had to talk it over with my husband because it's a big commitment. We went to 26 parades. We were in 26 parades. We went to the St. Paul Winter Carnival. We went to a Festival de Voyagers in Winnipeg, Canada. And then there are lots of local extra things you participate in too, like when, um, like the Crescent Apple Festival and Sparta Butter Days and uh, all the local festivals besides. What did you have to do to become Mrs. Oktoberfest? Was it? from your volunteer work and stuff and they nominated you? Or? Was it, yeah, somebody nominated me and there's a selection committee of about seven people and then they vote and I don't think it's anything you can, can come campaign for, it just sort of happens I guess uh, that someone nominates you and they think that you have made community contributions that make you worthy. And you also helped out the Salvation Army? Oh yeah, we've worked there for years. Like when, when our kids were your age, we used to go down at Thanksgiving time and help serve the Thanksgiving meal. That was before there was the community Thanksgiving dinner. And I've worked at uh, the thrift store and I've uh, helped at Christmas time when they take applications for people in need for Christmas baskets, carrying tree, etc. So I've, I've done a lot, and I've worked in the warehouse, <laughs> so I've done lots of different things for the Salvation Army. I, I, have, a, I have a picture somewhere of, um, I was the volunteer of the year in 1998. <laughs> All right, um, now talking about your family, what kind of professions do your siblings have? 
Well, my si- my brother is, I only have one brother, and he's seven years older than I am, and he stayed on the family farm. He graduated from the University of Wisconsin also with a major in genetics, but decided that uh, he liked living on the farm, and he liked animals, and so he used his genetic major in um, building a wonderful herd of Guernsey cattle. Um, did your sibling promote you to what you did through all your amazing life? Well, you see, he was seven years older than I was, so we kind of went our separate ways. I think we're, I think we're a lot closer now that we're older, but, uh, you know, he was, when I was in first grade, he was in eighth grade, you know, so. How did your uh, parents help you hinder your success? Well, I, th- I think I had a wonderful, when I look back, I'm just so thankful I had the parents that I did have. They always supported me, and um, I always felt special, and they sent a wonderful expanse. And, Norwegian American parents aren't that outwardly expressive. I mean, we're not the hugging, kissing type, but I always knew that I was loved, you know. Yeah. So. Did your parents do any type of community work? Well, what kind did they do and stuff? Well, my mother uh, was Sunday school superintendent. She taught Sunday school. She got the homemakers organized in the area. And she was the one who made arrangements to bring a music teacher into the school, so we had piano lessons and stuff. So, you know, she was she was a promoter. <laughs> Did any of your family or friends play piano? I, I play piano. My son plays piano. Um, he's a jazz pianist in New York, and uh, the our granddaughter plays some, and our grandson hasn't had any formal lessons, but he still plunks around and does okay. I've been playing piano for about nine years now, taking lessons. How long did your kids have lessons for, or or just your son? Did he ever have lessons or no? Yeah, he did. He first he had he took some lessons from Brian Blackmore for a couple years, and then he didn't take any for a while, and then he took from Juanita Beck for a while, and then he just kind of went off on his own. And then when he was older, he went to the conservatory in Milwaukee a couple of years. Alright, um... Who do you take from? Uh, Kathy Peterson. Okay. She lives in the Crescent. Okay. And, um... I have a question. Um, oh. What effect did your work have on either your kids or your relationship with your husband? Well, my husband has been very su- supportive of everything that I've done, which is which is really nice. Because if if he wasn't, that would, I guess, I wouldn't be able to participate as much. <coughs> I ho- I hope that my volunteer work has had ha- has a, had an influence on my children. I think it has. Our son in New York has has done volunteer work at a homeless shelter, and uh, our daughter in in Beaver Dam teaches Sunday school. I mean, it's kind of hard when you're working full-time as a teacher and have family and stuff to do a lot of volunteer work, but uh, she volunteers at her church and and other things at school. And my daughter in Minneapolis is the same. All right. Um, what was your most honorable moment or job that you had throughout your career? The honorable moment. Well, I think one of them was when I was recognized by the Chamber of Commerce as, the, they call it the Volunteer of the Year then. It used, to be, it used to be the Man of the Year, and then a couple of women got the award, and then they kind of changed the name. But this was in 96, I got um, the Volunteer to Business and Community Award, and that was... That was a big honor, completely unexpected, but it was a big honor. Okay, so, um, you said that your family supported you. How did they support you? Pardon? How did your family support you? 
Well, they, they supported me emotionally by saying you're okay and, and supported the things that I did. They supported me financially when I went to college. And um, I guess that's the best I can explain it. <laughs> So, um, what events have made you questions, you make you questions your own values and beliefs? Can you say that again? Um, what events have made you question your own values or beliefs, or aren't there any? Well. <laughs> I find it hard to believe that we elected Bush a second time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that would make it. <laughs> I don't know. Another thing that I have done, which I don't know if there was, is, is I've been a hospice volunteer for over 20 years. And... Um, I was involved in the beginning when they f first wrote the handbook and all. I didn't write the handbook. Two of the people who were coming in that you're going to be interviewing wrote the handbook. But um, it's when, when someone, when the, the physician determines that someone has six months or less to live possibly, then the, you are eligible for the hospice program. And so most of the work is done in the home. And like we do respite work for someone who wife needs to get out to do grocery shopping, who needs to go to a medical appointment, or who just needs a break from being a constant caregiver. And so we have special, they give us special training and we go in and we sit with the patient. And that's been, <coughs> that's been very rewarding. Did your success in your later life affect your children's <coughs> uh, jobs and stuff? Well, I think we always let our kids, uh, what's the expression? If you want to really make them, you let them fly. And I guess the careers that they pick for themselves kind of amazed me because I cannot imagine, and, and David has tried to explain it to me, what playing the piano is like and what... Um, keeps him going and what what a f wonderful feeling it is when something is accomplished and our second daughter is a high school history teacher and our third our second daughter is um, a psycho psychologist and I guess by allowing him to do what they wanted to do instead of because we had a family business and it would have been very easy to, for to say well we want you to keep the business going, we want you to stay in the family and do this. Um, I think letting them do their own thing. What kind of job does your hu husband have? Okay, uh, he, uh, community, you're probably too young to know where community camera was, but it was at 506 Main in downtown La Crosse, and it was a family business, and they sold TVs, VCRs. We, sold, we had the Apple computer franchise, the educational franchise. So we used to have people that, that would go on the road and, and uh, sell <laughs> Apple computers and set them up and service them at the schools. And upstairs we had um, cameras, VCRs, uh, all kinds of stereo equipment, uh, sound equipment. And, and our own service department. So that's the business that my husband was involved in. His father started the business, and then he continued in it. Did he help you with volunteer work and stuff? Yeah, like, like, like Salvation Army work, a lot of that we did together, uh, together as a couple or as a family. And um, he, League of Women Voters he wasn't too involved in, but <laughs> he was willing to hold down the fort while I was doing other things. Was there any organizations that I missed talking about? Well, let's see. Well, I guess the, the La Crosse Community Foundation, we started a women's fund. 
and I was on the first board of directors for that, and that has really grown. I'm not as involved anymore, but uh, you can make don't they have events, and part of the purpose is for to support women's organizations and to develop philanthropy in your children and uh, and anybody else to to give back and that has really grown by leaps and bounds and I oh well, I well I was going through way back I was the first woman that was appointed to the plan commission back in the 70s I had been president of the League of Women Voters and so that kind of makes you recognized in the political world I guess you can say and so I was the first woman appointed to the City Plan Commission and I was the first woman who became a member of SCORE which is it stands for the Senior Corps of Retired Executives and it's an organization that helps people who are want to go into business and everything is free we had space in the Chamber of Commerce building, and somebody's going to start up a business, they come in, and we look over their uh, plan, and maybe make suggestions on advertising or whatever, and, and uh, it's completely confidential. And so I was involved in that for a while. Since you were the president of the League of Women Voters, it was a big job, what all did you have to do? Oh my. Well, w w you had to make sure everybody else on the board was doing what they were supposed to do. And then you, at that time, we had what you call time for action. So if there was some legislation pending on either the state or the national level, you had to write a letter stating the league's position and why they supported or opposed it. And uh, it was before emails and telephones were s so inexpensive. So you had to do it by snail mail and type it and um, what accomplishment in your life are you most proud of I'm glad you asked my family <laughs> I think in spite of all the volunteer work this this is my greatest accomplishment we, my husband and I will be celebrating our 15th wedding anniversary this summer. And um, the three children grew up to be pretty decent citizens. And we have two grandchildren we adore. And so that's my greatest accomplishment. I, I brought some things that are kind of fun. We like to travel and We've been on Good Morning America twice. <laughs> we go to visit our son in New York, and so we emailed and got tickets, and then we got there early, so we got in the front row. And so we got uh, Charlie Gibson and Diane Sawyer's autograph. And the second time we were there, that's when the Westby Cheese Company had just come out with the individual traveling packs of cheese curds, and they, were the, and they had the official endorsement of the Green Bay Packers. And so I had little packets of those along that I was able to give to Diane Sawyer and Robin Roberts and Tony Perkins and Charlie Gibson. And in the time when they're off the air, they were having a great time. They were pitching those back and forth and it was fun. Um, what other stuff did you bring that you could share? Well, here's, here's some of my Oktoberfest. I mean, here are, this is Oktoberfest. You have to design a pin. And, <coughs> excuse me. And my nickname is Tiger because my maiden name was Tiger. And so all my friends from high school and college still call me Tiger. And so I had to have a tiger on there. And then I believe in volunteering. So I had volunteers are wonderful. And this was my... I, sh I should have brought enough pins so everybody could have one. I could bring those later. And the, this is a Mrs. Oktoberfest crown, and I should change it. It's, this is Black Hills gold, and it's designed so then when your year is over, this snaps off, and then you put a chain on here, and it becomes a necklace. <coughs>
And here is some, this, my husband and I. And this is the article that was in the paper. <coughs> they do give you a clothing allowance because those dirndls are fairly expensive. And then I do have This is a Norwegian costume. It's called a bunad. And when a girl is confirmed, usually around the age of 13, she gets her bunad. And it you can't really see it here, but there are extra seams that on the side that can be let out. So you wear usually you wear it for your wedding. And um, this and you can tell by looking at the dress what part of Norway someone is from. Now my relatives are from Gudbrandsdalen, and so this is the official bunad for that area. What are like the different types of dresses that you would know if they're from a different place? Oh yeah, you. Can, uh, I'm not really an expert on bunads, but you, but people who know can look and say, oh, they're from Sunnyfjord, or they're from. Telemark, or they're from Hardanger, or they're, you know, different places. And let's see. I belong to the Ellis Island Foundation. <laughs> and so I have, um, I paid money, and so my grandmother and my mother-in-law each have a brick at Ellis Island, and our family has a, Kodak had a promotion where you could send in your family picture, so every time we go to Ellis Island, we look it up on the Kodak thing and find our family picture. Does everyone get bricks at Ellis Island? Or no, you, have, like to pay, you have to pay for that. It, they use it as a fundraiser. All right. But it, it's, a re it's really become a wonderful, they have a website, and, the, and they keep adding to the website, so you can look up and see when you're hopefully find the ship, you know, where your relatives came on and what time, what month and what year they came through Ellis Island. And it will tell other things too, like it'll tell where their destination is, who they are going to see, how much money they had with them. Like when my mo mother, my husband's grandmother came, or husband's mother came, she was going to North Dakota and she had eight dollars. But that was pretty standard, I mean, eight dollars because usually they had, their fare was paid. Like her husband had come first, worked, saved money, and then he sent money back and that included a ticket to come over on the boat plus train fare from n New York to North Dakota. What made you and your family want to live in Wisconsin? Well, I think when my relatives first came in 1854 and 1857. They came as far as Kashkanang initially, which is a Norwegian settlement in Dane County close to Stoughton, where Stoughton is now. And then later in the year, then they came as far as Westby because there were other Norwegians from their area that were already living in that area. So they came as far as Westby, and that's kind of where they stayed. Um, where do you live now? In La Crosse. La Crosse. Three blocks east of the Erickson Pool, <laughs> which is a great attraction for our grandkids when they come. Yeah. In fact, I want to know, want you to know I even went down the slide. <laughs> My granddaughter said, Grandma, it's the biggest splash I've ever seen. <laughs> kind of hobbies do you have now? Well, I'd say genealogy is one of my big hobbies, and, and I used to enjoy photography. I still enjoy photography. In fact, I have an article. Once upon a time, I took a photojournalism class at the university just for enrichment, and I had an article and pictures published in the Lacrosse Tribune as part of my project. So, but I would say now, I would say genealogy is my main hobby. What is your husband's 
watching television, watching the History Channel and the Weather Channel. <laughs> <laughs> What do you think would be your favorite time w with your family? Well, I guess n now that we're kind of so spread out, any time we're together is special. And we just g uh, got back from Washington, D.C. Our whole family w was able to go. Our daughter was administering a federal grant in her school, and so she had to go there for a conference. And so it was a week before they had spring break in Beaver Dam, and so the grandchildren were free. And so we decided, well, why don't we all go? So we did. Our daughter from Minneapolis flew in, and our son from New York took the Amtrak down. And so we had five days in D.C. with our family, and that was special. You guys got any more questions? Or? Um, were your expectations the same for your children as your parents were for you? You know, I don't really know what my parents expectations were for me I guess they were very supportive of, of education and so they made sure both my brother and I got a college education and I guess I assumed that for my children too now our, our son who is the jazz pianist took as many courses as he felt could benefit him and he couldn't see any reason for taking a foreign language and so he did not get his degree. However, I wished he would have, and uh, it's always nice to fall back on. Do you think life is harder or easier for children nowadays, like kids? I think it's harder because you have so many more choices. W when I was young, I didn't have that many choices, you know? Yeah. What do you think? I don't know. <laughs> Hard to tell yeah, since you haven't li since like we haven't lived back then. It's a lot yeah. different than for you. Does he have any more questions? Or? Um, is there anything that you couldn't live without? That I couldn't live without? Probably my computer. <laughs> in what way um, do you think people of your generations have made an impact on future? Well, I think, I think our generation was very generous. I think um, if you look at any of the charitable organizations, whether it's the United Way or the Salvation Army or, or the churches or anybody, I think our generation has been very generous. And I think, well, That's one contribution, I guess. Do you think all the volunteer work that you did seriously impact, impacted the cross and the way it goes pretty well? Or I'd like to think so. I don't know how I'll ever know, uh, except uh, like with the Storybook Project, you do get some direct feedback so you know. Uh, because I have talked to women who are, who, who are now older who receive books from their mothers and how they looked forward to it and how much it meant to them. If you hadn't gone to college, do you think you would have been able to do all the things that you've done yeah. in your life? Yeah, I think so. I think, I think education is important, but I think you can do a lot without by just working hard do you think that everyone should go to college or at least get a chance to go to college well i think i don't think everybody needs to go to college i think technical school is great for some people and if you've tried to find a craftsman like a plumber or an electrician or something like that you you wish there were more of them so i i think it has to be what is right for the individual. And whether that's college or technical school or whatever, I think that's fine. What are some of your values that have endured or strengthened as your life progressed? Well, I believe in hard work. 
I believe in patience, which I'm not always as good as as I'd like to be. I believe in, in kindness and lifting up people when they need a little bit of a lift. Um, I believe I believe you have to have a f fun in life. It isn't all work. From some of the things that we've talked about, it I, sounds like my life was all work, but it wasn't. I had a lot of fun along the way. And I think um, the people in a lot of the organizations that I've been in have become my closest friends. And so I think friendship is a very important in your life. Okay, um, what statements would you say represent the philosophy of your life? Boy, you guys ask tough questions, you know <laughs> that? <laughs> What statements reflect my philosophy? Well, I suppose the golden rule, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Um, one thing my mother used to say, be careful what you say with words because once you've said them, you can't take them back. And <laughs> words can be very painful sometimes. Um, I don't know. It's too early in the morning. I need more <laughs> coffee. Um, what are some of your challenges today? Some of my challenges today? Uh, trying to find someone to help around the house. <laughs> <laughs> like if, you, if you try to find someone who does just handiwork, you know, like fixing a few boards on a deck or something like that, it's very challenging to find someone. Um, I guess trying to gracefully let go. I think at at some point in an in a life of an organization, something you've been very involved in, there comes a time when you have to kind of let go and go on to something else. And I'm kind of in that period now. My husband has some health needs that uh, limit some of my activities, and so I'm finding I have to kind of back off a little. And that's that's kind of hard to do. <laughs> that's so involved. I want to be there. What disadvantages and limitations have you felt in your life, and how have you dealt with them? Disadvantages? And li well, I can talk about limitations. About th three years ago, I was cleaning the, I was up on a ladder cleaning the leaves out of the gutter, and I fell off and broke my back. So that was a limitation. It, it made me realize how lucky we are when we have our health and our abilities. And I had a new procedure, which instead of fusion surgery, which was wonderful, and then I had to be in a body brace for three months. But um, it made me appreciate what some people with disabilities have to deal with all the time. And so that's one of the limitations. Where did you find encouragement in your early years? In my early years? Well, I, I'd say my grandma was a big influence. My parents were a big influence, of course, but my grandma was too, because my grandma, maybe, maybe all children feel this way, but I always felt like I was my grandma's favorite. Do you feel like you're the favorite? Yeah. <laughs> you too? No? No, my little cousins get <laughs> But she, al she always encouraged me, and my parents encouraged me too. Was there anything you wanted to do as a child but didn't get to do? Well, I think I probably would have liked to have gone swimming more, but you don't remember what it was like, but it was polio was a big factor when I was growing up. And there would be polio epidemic in the summer and so you, you wouldn't go you wouldn't go to the swimming pool you wouldn't go to the movie theater because they people didn't know what caused it and so they were leery about getting people to get together in a group they thought you know maybe this is how it was spread and stuff so my grandpa actually had that 
my grandpa had polio too. He died. Did, did he really? He died from the polio? Well, it was a major factor. But my grandpa, like, one of his legs is kind of like an inch shorter than mm-hmm. the other one, so that's how it affected him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and now they're finding that people who had polio when they were younger, sometimes there are some after effects that, that surface after they get older, too. No. Was there anything when you were a child that you wanted to do but you didn't get to? Oh, I'm sure there was. <laughs> um, what is probably one of the best memories that you have? The best memories that I have. I think the birth of our children. That was special. That's all I got. Yeah. Let's see if I got anything else. That ought to do it. This podcast brought to you from La Crosse, Wisconsin by the Cooley Kids at Longfellow Middle School in conjunction with the League of Women Voters.